Okay, good morning. I'm Betsy Sigarecki with the Nature Conservancy in Pennsylvania and Delaware. Welcome to our virtual TNC coffee series. Today, we are joined by the University of Delaware's John Cohen, who will highlight what he is finding in his sampling of microplastics in Delaware's waters. Followed by Delaware Sea Grant's Kate Fleming, giving a review of different textile fabric types and how that relates to what you might see on your clothing tag. For those of you who are new to the series, a few bits of housekeeping before we begin. We are recording today's session so that it can be shared on our website and social media channels. Because we are recording, we request that all participants remain on mute during the presentation. And if you have a question or comment, please type them in the chat box and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. So thank you and we're looking forward to a great discussion. And with that, good morning, John and Kate. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'll go ahead and start. So um, as, as Betsy said, I'm John Cohen from the University of Delaware and I'll lead off the, uh, the remarks this, this morning. Um, if we can go ahead and move to the next slide, uh, Kate, thanks. So I just wanted to make the point that you know, modern science is really a team effort. And so I'm here talking, but what I'll talk about is the work of many, many people. Um, so we are thankful of course, for the support that we get from the state, um, state funding agencies, private funding agencies, and the federal government. Senator Carper has been, been involved and helpful with what we've been doing. Um, graduate students are listed at the top, Hayden, Anna, Alan, Taylor, Julia, and many, many others um, who've helped with what I'm gonna talk about, as well as colleagues from the University of Delaware, um, Tobias Kokolka, Helga Huntley, and Tracy DeLiberty. Oh, uh, let's see, uh, perfect. Uh, the next slide, please. So uh, I was trying to change it on my own computer. Um, so. Um, if you've ever seen the movie The Graduate, you know that there's sort of an iconic scene about plastics and you know the future is plastics. And that was in 1967. And if you look at what's happened since, since um, the, the 50s and 60s in terms of plastic production, which is what this graph shows you, this is showing an exponential increase um, in plastic production. And so as the years go on from the 1950s to, to present, we're seeing more and more plastic being produced. Interestingly, about half of the plastic that's been manufactured has been manufactured in the last handful of years. And of that disposable packaging is really what the major use of, of plastic is. That's the pink colored um, shaded area on this graph. And so what you can see in, these, in, this, uh, in this little graphic are the length of time that that material lasts. And you'll notice that packaging lasts less than six months. And in fact, um, when you open up a sandwich that was wrapped in plastic, that plastic is useful to you for you know, a matter of minutes maybe. And so um, really short-lived plastic materials. Consumer products and textiles, you can see a little bit more, you know, three to five years. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what's happened to all that plastic? Um, this is sort of a, a, um, a mass balance or a budget of all the plastic that's been ever produced since the 1950s. And so you can see that blue arrow coming in on the left side um, is all the plastic that's been produced. Some of it's been in, is, is currently in use, about 29%. Um, but, you know, over um, well over half of that plastic has been discarded or incinerated. And so um, that's sort of just been brought away from the system. Some also has been recycled. And you can see that little 7% recycling loop bringing material back in. And so we pr have produced a lot of plastic. We produced a lot of it in recent times. And a lot of that has been just, just lost as waste. So we can go to the next slide. So we talk about plastic, but one thing to think about is microplastic. And so what we think is that really small pieces of plastic, the breakdown products of larger pieces in particular, are the most abundant plastic in the marine environment. And we see this on beaches, we see it in the sea surface, we see it in Arctic sea ice, we see it in remote mountains like the Pyrenees, and deep ocean depths we also see uh, plastic. So plastic is everywhere, not just where it's produced, but it gets uh, moved around the earth, both in the water through currents, as well as in the atmosphere through, through air currents. So we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so what you might have heard about are garbage patches. And so in the Pacific in particular, large sort of almost floating islands of trash. While they certainly exist, one of the more insidious ways to think about plastic is probably to think about it more like a soup 
like a really thin soup where the ocean itself and our coastal waters actually have a lot of plastic in them that aren't big garbage patches, but rather are just sort of um, sort of infiltrated with plastic that's much smaller that can be in the water column at the surface, um, gathered on the shorelines. And so all of that material is, um, is out there in the environment. So it's really more like a plastic soup rather than these large floating, uh, floating garbage patches. Okay, next slide, please. And so what we've been doing is doing observations from boats as well as computer simulations, computer models to help us understand where plastic is coming from and also how it gets distributed and how long it stays in Delaware Bay in our coastal waters. So we can go to the next slide. What have we learned from that? So the next slide, please. Let's start with a question. And so a question for you all to answer, um, and there's a poll that should have just shown up for you, um, is, do you think the concentration of microplastics that I've been talking about, small plastic pieces, would be higher in Delaware Bay or in the tidal rivers feeding the bay? So the bay itself or the tidal rivers feeding the bay? Okay, we've got answers coming in. They're all there. Good. Okay. Let's see. So have we, we our poll has closed, it looks like. And so we've got 75% think higher concentrations in the bay and about 25% the tidal rivers that are feeding the bay. So let's take a look at, um, at the next slide and we will see this. So we've looked at this question and so we've sampled Delaware Bay, we've sampled tidal rivers. Um, so we've sampled the lower Delaware River entering the bay. We've sampled the bay proper at a variety of stations. We've sampled the Murder Kill and St. Jones rivers, which are um, sort of around Dover area. We've sampled Rehoboth Bay and the Delaware Inland Bays, um, Indian River Bay, um, you can see here. And um, I just wanted to highlight, so what we do is we do a couple different things. We drag nets through the water and then we do a various chemical processes in the lab to isolate the plastics and um, then use some um, spectroscopy, shine light on it in various controlled ways to figure out what polymer types the plastic is. So we can go to the next slide. The bubbles here represent the amount of plastic, or really the concentration of plastic, pieces of plastic per cubic meter. And what you see is the bigger the bubble and the bigger the number, the higher the plastic. And one thing that you'll realize is Delaware Bay comes in at around 0.7 pieces of microplastic per cubic meter, whereas the, the tidal rivers come in at, you know, three, four and a half, three. And so it's opposite to, to what, to actually what most, most people had, had guessed. Um, so it's the rivers that are bringing material from the land and then um, and from from rivers and the, that all is entering the bay and being diluted, particularly with ocean water, which presumably has even less plastic. OK, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so one of the things we look at is the shape of the material. So are these little beads? Are they fibers? Are they fragments? And so let's go ahead to the next slide. If we look at Delaware Bay versus the rivers in the Delaware Inland Bays, which is shown um, up there in the upper right, Delaware Bay seems to have more fragments than fibers, whereas the rivers seem to have more fibers than fragments. And so we're getting fibers coming in from the rivers in particular, and that can be from wastewater treatment plants, it can be um, from, from other sources as well, um, which are gonna enter in through the rivers. Um, one thing I did want to note just to remind or uh, tell you actually is we're doing more analyses, not just of surface waters, but of deeper waters. And we do find um, even in spots in Delaware Bay where we thought we had more fragments, fibers tend to be more abundant if you look deeper. Um, and so that's also another thing to think about is not just what's at the surface, but actually what's deeper as well. So let's go to the next, the next uh, thing. So the other thing we look at is plastic polymer type. So what types of plastic is this? And so we can go to the, and this is the instrument we use for that. It's a Fourier transformed infrared spectroscopy instrument, but it just, it's a fancy way to shine light through the plastic and how the light interacts with the plastic we can interpret as being a certain type of polymer. So polyethylene and polypropylene are the common ones that we see in Delaware Bay. Um, polyethylene, polypropylene also in the rivers, but we also see because of the more fiber, the fiber types that we're seeing there, we see a lot of polyester and rayon too. So more um, commercial fabrics, uh, so clothing materials. Let's go to the next slide. So I just wanted to, to highlight, um, and you can go ahead and pull, actually hold on, don't play the video yet. Um, so um, one of the things we do when we do computer models is we say, okay, um, what would happen if we were to take the, the Delaware Bay and lay over the top of it a layer of floating plastic? That's what the red is. 
And then on the right are the concentrations of plastic at any moment in time. So the redder the, the field gets on the right, the more plastic there is at a given spot. So let's go ahead and play it. And so you can see now the, the model is starting up and you can see the tides moving in and out. Tides are moving in and out. The plastic is aggregating like that. And you can see it's aggregating in these thin lines, um, tide lines, they're called. Play it one more time, if you would, Kate. And so now we're, we're watching the, the model spin up and plastic, which was evenly distributed, is aggregating in, in tide lines. And so what we think is happening is that in the real world, um, this is what the situation looks like. There are very discrete hot spots of plastic, um, not just a uniform layer of plastic. Let's go to the next slide. And so we have these hot spots where salty and fresh water mix. The fresher water carries more plastic coming from rivers and it mixes with less plastic in the bay. So let's go ahead to the next slide. So how much microplastic is actually in Delaware Bay? I mentioned it was like 0.7 pieces per cubic meter. You probably don't think very well about what a cubic meter is, but basically that's like half a bathtub filled with water. Um, and one little microplastic piece in there looks like that. But if you think about the hot spots, let's go to the next, the next uh, advance at one, it's likely that there are areas with 100 to 1,000 times those concentrations. So what looked like one little piece of plastic in a bathtub um, now actually is a lot more if you think about those hot spots that I just showed you um, as that material coming in from rivers gets aggregated in the bay. So let's go to the next slide. Um, the last thing I wanted to, to mention um, before turning it back to Kate um, is that we did a study of plastic in blue crabs, adult blue crabs that were collected from two rivers in Delaware, the, the Blackbird Creek and the Murderkill River. And what we found was that there are half the crabs we tested, roughly 48% of the crabs had plastic in them. And of those, um, most of the plastic was in the stomachs and up to five pieces of plastic per crab were found. Of that, polyester and rayon were the dominant polymer types. It was fibers that they were primarily um, primarily ingesting, and um, polyester and rayon, again, were, were the dominant materials ingested. So it's not just in the environment, but it's actually in, in biota as well. So the last slide is just, um, a note, and there's a web link that I think will come through the chat at some point, um, and Kate has it in her slides as well. Um, we have some lesson plans and resources for thinking about microplastics and other other um, sorts of things that we work on here at um, underthescope.udel.edu. So thank you, and I'll turn it over to Kate. All right, thanks, John. Um, so as John and Betsy said, I'm Kate Fleming, and I'm Delaware Coast, I am Delaware Sea Grants Coastal Ecology Specialist. Uh, we're going to have questions at the end. Um, but now I'm going to take a little time to build off of what we just heard from John and talk more specifically about the topic of microfibers and how that relates to domestic laundry. So just a quick recap as far as that topic goes from what we heard from John. Uh, micro, uh, microfibers are the most common type of microplastic that John is finding in his samples in, the Del in Delaware's tributaries as well as the inland bays, and it sounds like also deeper water environments in Delaware Bay, with polyester and rayon being some of the dominant microfiber types in those samples. And he's even finding some of these microfibers in the stomachs of local seafood species like blue crabs. And since uh, these microfibers, polyester and rayon in particular, are uh, commonly used in fibers in clothing products, we're, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more. It's well recognized um, that the affluent from washing machines is one of the major contributors to microfibers in our waterways. And since we all are probably doing laundry with washing machines, uh, that's kind of why we're focusing on that today. So I want to just kind of start with the basics and break it down. Um, these textile fibers that are used in clothing can be categorized very broadly, either as natural, synthetic, or semi-synthetic fiber types. So we've got our natural products that are based on plants and animals, um, and so they're biodegradable. When we think about environmental uh, environmental sustainability topics, we might think about farming practices of growing or cultivating some of those products. So for example, if a farmer is using pesticides to grow that cotton. 
And then synthetic fibers are produced using man-made polymers that usually come from the byproducts of petroleum. And so they are plastic. And as plastic, they do not degrade over long periods of time. And so when we think about the environmental sustainability topics, we're thinking about that lack of uh, breakdown, but also potential uh, impacts associated with the extraction of these natural resources, associated oil spills, maybe, maybe the emissions associated with creating that plastic product. And then finally, we have semi-synthetic fibers, which are interesting. So um, this is also referred to as regenerated cellulose. So cellulose is the, it, are plants, it's what plants are made of. Um, and so semi-synthetic fibers are based on plants. So you might take the pulp of wood or bamboo or cotton and then uh, mix that with chemicals. And then the fibers are extruded through that process. And so being based on plants, uh, it is understood that semi-synthetic fibers do break down over time. And the environmental considerations really have to do with the toxic emissions associated with creating that product and using those chemicals. So we're going to stop for a quick poll question and I'll just ask you all to consider maybe the shirt you're wearing or some other clothing item and tell us if you think that it's made of a natural synthetic or semi synthetic product. So we've got some responses coming in where we've got uh, oh it's pretty even everyone's pretty across the board um, about a third natural synthetic and semi synthetic cool all right. I didn't share those results. Maybe I should have shared those results. All right, um, so we're gonna move on and now talk about how this um, translates to what you might actually see on your clothing tag. So our natural fabrics may be fairly familiar to you with cotton coming from the seed, the seed pods of cotton plants. Linen for me was actually a little bit less familiar. Um, linen is created by taking the stalks of flax plants and soaking them and then drying them and crushing them to create that linen product. Um, silk comes from the filaments of silkworm cocoons that are often cultivated and wool comes from shearing the hair up of animals like sheep or goats or even camels. And then we have synthetic fabrics. So these again are our plastic fabrics and they, there are lots of different types of plastic fabrics. Nylon um, was the first uh, plastic fabric that was used in clothing applications. So nylon hosiery was the first um, actual clothing application, but we see nylon used in all kinds of uh, clothing products now. Polyester is another really versatile uh, uh, plastic fabric type. I use the example here of a micro fleece because micro fleece have been identified to be a fairly large emitter of microfibers into our waterways. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Acrylic was created to mimic wool and then elastin and spandex are essentially the same thing. They've got a stretch characteristic to them. So we see them in swimwear or athletic wear. And polypropylene is a little bit less common. I was looking around in my own closet. I don't, I wasn't able to find any polypropylene uh, in my closet. But if you have some extreme like cold weather base layers, you might have polypropylene. And this isn't a comprehensive list. It's just some of the more common uh, synthetic fabric types that are used in clothing. And then finally, semi-synthetic fabrics. Again, we're not gonna see that regenerated cellulose term on your tag. Um, these are your rayons. So you might see rayon or viscose rayon, or it might say viscose from bamboo. Modal and lyocell are um, rayon types that actually, so the industry has recognized this, the emissions associated with the chemical use to create rayon is fairly problematic. And so they are uh, trying to come up with processes to minimize those emissions. So mo modal and lyocell are examples of rayon processes that have been developed to try and minimize some of those impacts with tensile being a branded form of lyocell and then acetate. So our next poll question is to actually take a look at your tag now um, of whatever other clothing item you're considering and report to us um, if, if you believe it's a natural fiber, synthetic or semi-synthetic or maybe some kind of mix. So we've got lots of, lots of natural fibers. Not a lot of semi-synthetic. All right, so oh, we've got a few more coming in. We've got mostly natural fibers from people this morning. Cool. All right, moving on and stop share results. 
Okay, so there's been quite a bit of uh, interest from the industry and scientists to try and understand this microfiber shedding a little bit better as it relates to domestic laundry. So there have been a number of studies that have tried to take a look at um, different textile characteristics. Are we talking about synthetic clothing versus uh, natural fabrics or some kind of mix, maybe that uh, semi-synthetic? Uh, how old are these uh, different uh, textiles? Do they have short or long form fibers? These aren't things that you'll necessarily see on your tag when you're going to make a clothing purchase, but they're things that could inform the, industry, the textile industry in um, producing clothing. And then of course, there's lots of different machine, washing machine variables. And then of course, uh, human choices. So are you using detergent? What kinds and what cycle are you choosing? What temperatures? And so uh, it turns out there's just a lot of variables and it's really hard to look at the literature, the scientific literature and kind of pull out best practices for, oh, if you do these things, you'll minimize microfiber shedding. So the science is still emerging and it's difficult. Um, as an example, there was one study that identified that um, top loading machines appeared to be associated with more microfiber shedding than front loading machines, but then scientists were quick to po point out that that top loading machine also had a central agitator, and perhaps that was uh, more important than had been discussed in that particular study. But there are a few things that we can start to think about and take away at a higher level. And the first is just to, again, come back to that initial assumption we started this presentation with. It is fairly well recognized in the science that domestic laundry is a widespread source of plastic microfiber emissions into our waterways. Another thing to consider is that all fabrics shed, regardless of natural fabrics versus synthetic or semi-synthetic. They'll all shed and they'll shed over the course of their lifetime, although some fabric types may shed more or less, depending on various characteristics. Um, one thing that is fairly consistent in the literature is that microfleece, that's a specific type of polyester, is consistently identified as a high volume emitter of plastic into our waterways. And so that's something um, to keep in mind. This is something we see where microfiber loads of laundry can, excuse me, microfleece can lead to the emissions of hundreds of thousands of microfibers in a single load of laundry. Um, and then there are mitigation tools that can be used or at least considered uh, to try and minimize emissions of microfibers when you're doing laundry at home. And we haven't talked about those yet. Um, so we're gonna talk about them now. There've been a couple of studies that have tried to take a look at some of these mitigation tools and actually test their efficacy. So um, the first kind of, I, I kind of categorize these in two broad ways where uh, they might be uh, tools that are actually used inside the drum of your washing machine when you're doing a load of laundry. So uh, washing bags, for example, can be used in that way. And then there is one particular product on the market I'm aware of uh, that's a laundry ball that's intended to actually capture microfibers in these kind of long tentacle arms. Um, and what the studies have found with these in-machine mitigation tools are that they're, they seem to be effective. Um, most the guppy friend in this particular study that I have up here was most effective in minimizing microfiber emissions, but they seem to be more effective in actually minimizing shedding as opposed to capturing microfibers. And then we have filters, um, which were also tested in this study. So we've got a couple filters that uh, were tested by being installed. These are installed on the your actual water line associated with your washing machine. They're appropriate for domestic machines as opposed to commercial grade that you might see in a laundromat. And they were effective in capturing about 25 to 30% of microfibers in a load of laundry, but by far the most effective product that was tested in this study uh, was, uh, was a, a product that is meant to be installed during the manufacture of the washing machine and it's still in prototype form. So it's my understanding that this last product, this X-Filtra as an example, um, is not yet to market, but it might be something uh, that you keep a lookout for if you're looking for a new washing machine. Uh, we may see this kind of technology incorporated into washing machines in the future. And so with this uh, information, we can kind of leave you with some ideas about uh, what you can be thinking about uh, when you're making clothing choices and laundry choices. So the first is uh, simply to consider the fabrics that you are using when you're acquiring clothing. You could consider your wash frequency and I'm not 
not suggesting that people stop washing their clothes, but you might consider uh, your micro fleeces are oftentimes outerwear and not right next to your skin. So perhaps they don't need to be washed quite as frequently. And then you could consider uh, using or keeping an eye out for some of these fiber catching products um, or perhaps some combination of these ideas. And with that, we'll wrap up with one final uh, poll question. Which of these wash with wisdom practices do you think you might be most likely to try? Give folks a chance to, to respond. All right. We've got lots of people considering fabric choices and maybe even uh, decreasing wash frequency. And then we have some, some ideas of these mitigation tools. Cool. We give people, I think we can wrap that up. All right, cool. Uh, considering fabric choices seem to be the biggest idea. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Um, so with that, uh, I think John and I can take questions now if there are any questions. We do have one in the chat of, does this study mean that the bigger problem is our clothing rather than the plastic bottles and bags? Uh, sure, I, I can start on that um, if you'd like, Kate. Um, so the, um, it's an interesting question because plastic bottles and bags, there's a few studies that suggest that when those materials fragment, depending on how they break down, they don't just break down into fragments, they can also break down into fibers. And so um, the, you can get fibers from textiles and there seems to be some suggestion that you can, you can certainly get them from rope as well. And so one of the things we're trying to do is parse out, you know, where, where do fibers come from? Are they coming from textiles? Are they coming from rope? Um, and we think it's, it's a balance. A lot of it is textiles. And so that would mean that clothing in some ways and textile breakdown is um, a bigger issue than the bottles and the bags. The thing where we where I showed you the data from the crabs in particular, that is of concern because fibers are predominantly what we're seeing in in crabs at least. And so um, I think we want to think about when we define what the problem is, it's not just what's there, but it's what's causing uh, an ecological effect. And so um, the fact that most of what we're seeing go into the organisms and the crabs in this case is fibers is, is problematic and speaks to um, the fibers and perhaps clothing being being the bigger issue than the bottles and the bags. But it's a tricky question. Thanks, John. I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment, but if you have a question, please type it in and we'll have John and Kate here for a few more minutes. Can bring us back to the end. Ah, that's what I get. I'll stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Kristen is asking, can fabric capture occur at the municipal level via sewage treatment? John, I think you might have some more familiarity with that than I do. Um, yes. So I've been in a few meetings with representatives from um, municipal sewage treatment, and they're actually kind of excited at the prospect of developing ways to capture this material and pass it on to, to the consumer. They feel that rather than having um, th that consolidated management of the issue is actually something that they can do because they've done it with nutrients. And so I think that there's a role for the individual to play as Kate, as Kate um, pointed out, there's also a role for, for municipal sewage to play. And so um, it's probably, the ultimate solutions are probably going to be a balance of those two things. But yes, it's possible and there's interest from, from um, the sewage folks to, to look at that. That's great. Um, and are microplastics and our seafood dangerous to us? They can be. Um, it's, that's an area where there's a lot of people interested and not a whole lot of data. There's, there's plenty of studies that go to fish markets and find plastics and seafood. 
um, the question is what's what impact is that having on the animals and then what impact is transferred to you so if the plastic isn't in the material that you eat the muscle for example of a fish or a crab then is that going to impact you well it might not um, or it might particularly if there's if there's chemicals that are attached to that plastic adsorbed to the plastic which then get liberated and then moved into the system of the organism that you're eating. And so um, lots more questions than answers, unfortunately, but it's something that um, is worth looking at more. And there are a lot of people who are looking at that more. Um, no good answer, unfortunately, but. Thanks, John. Is there anything we can do to encourage manufacturers to incorporate the internal filters in their products? Yeah, so I thought that this could be a question that might come up. And I think the first thing I'm going to mention is Delaware Sea Grant is um, a non-advocacy group. We're about um, putting the science out there to help with decision making. Um, but when I think about these kinds of things, um, you know, that it could be something that you consider talking to an advocacy group about um, when I think about changes that have been made in cars, for example, sometimes that comes from uh, policy level changes, um, but also maybe just expressing interest when you're going to a store to buy uh, a, a washing machine, you might express interest and, and show that demand is another way to kind of make your voice heard. Good suggestions, Keith. Um, so we'll wrap up with this one last question. Um, how should materials using recycled polyester be viewed? Do they shed to the same extent as standard polyester? I, I think that's just one of the additional variables at, that's really hard to tease apart, but I wouldn't expect that recycled polyester would be any different from any other uh, fabric type that sheds. Okay. Well, great. I wanted to thank you both and thank all of you for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed this presentation. We'll post the recording and resource links on our social media channels. Please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We keep up to date on our virtual excursions into nature and everything else about the Nature Conservancy. Thank you for your support. Learn more about our work at nature.org. Thanks again and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.